Where will war break out next? It's a question you could ask every year, but it's become more pertinent as we draw closer to 2024. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine seems unlikely to be resolved anytime soon, and it's only going to draw more countries in and create deeper divides as it goes on. Add to that Hamas's recent attacks on Israel and Israel's overwhelming response, and you have tensions running deeper in the Middle East than they have for years. It feels like we're on the cusp of a complete breakdown in relationships between the West and those countries that feel the West has too much of a say in the geopolitics of the world. But these are far from the only geopolitical hotspots that are at risk. As conflict rages in both Asia and Europe, other hotspots may be flying under the radar or finally reaching a boiling point, and some are likely to spark wars as we enter 2024. Those hotspots start with one that's been simmering for decades. Taiwan Tension in Taiwan is hardly a new thing. China's long claimed ownership of the territory, though the actual history is a little murkier. For instance, China says it laid claim to Taiwan during the Ming Dynasty, which ruled China between 1368 and 1644. But the evidence suggests that isn't the case. When the Dutch East India Company arrived in Taiwan in 1624, they found no evidence of Ming rule, leading to the Dutch being the first to actually introduce a governmental structure to Taiwan. The Ming Dynasty arrived a little later. A Ming follower named Koxinga, who was escaping the newly formed Qing Manchu Dynasty in China, assaulted the Dutch fortress of Zealandia in 1662. A battle raged with Koxinga's forces of 400 ships and 25,000 men eventually claiming victory, and Taiwan fell under the rule of Koxinga for the next 21 years. Then, the Qing Dynasty arrived and forced Koxinga's surrender at the Battle of Penghu in 1683 thus kickstarting China's quote official claim to the territory. That victory sparked 200 years of Chinese rule in Taiwan. But that rule ended after the Sino-Japanese War of the late 19th century, when Taiwan was ceded to Japan under the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Taiwan's elite weren't happy with that situation. They sparked a rebellion fighting for an independent Taiwan, while China essentially ignored the territory while it was under Japanese rule. It wasn't until 1943 that the Chinese Communist Party leaders started to claim Taiwan should be, quote, returned to China, with the end of World War II sparking the conflict that threatens to boil over to this day. Japan surrendered its ownership of Taiwan, but in the wake of the Chinese Civil War, the nationalist Chinese fled from the Communists to the island. Today, Taiwan has its own democratically elected leadership, but many in China still view it as a renegade province, one that China still owns making the area a definite geopolitical hotspot. After that little history lesson, you're probably asking a question, why 2024? These tensions between China and Taiwan have existed for decades, so why is 2024 the year when the war could finally break out? The answer is simple, China seems to be gearing up for conflict in the territory. In August 2023, China released a propaganda video that appeared to show troops running drills on the Taiwan Strait. China even made its intentions pretty clear with the video's title, reading the strait. While most of the video was fluff, one interesting part showed Chinese troops storming past anti-landing barricades that are similar to those Taiwan has already set up along its coast. It's important to note, the video never mentions Taiwan directly, but the message is clear and was expressed in a post accompanying the video, we're ready to fight at any time. Again, China hasn't made any direct statements of war just yet, but it's clear that it views reclaiming Taiwan as an important part of its efforts to establish its dominance in the South Asia region, and it's sending veiled messages that suggest it's preparing for war. Given that the US argues against China's efforts to isolate Taiwan, it's possible that China's decision to enter the territory could spark a situation similar to the one we see between Russia and Ukraine right now. Could the US and its Western allies get drawn into supporting Taiwan in the same way they're supporting Ukraine? It's all but certain. Taiwan is too important to the current liberal world order for the nation to fall into the Chinese Communist Party's hands. It's the leading producer of the world's most advanced microchips, and if it were to fall under Chinese control, the CCP would have incredible influence over global economies, even to the point of extorting nations to do its will. Even if the chip factories were simply destroyed in the fighting, the consequences would be disastrous, with a global chip shortage causing a planet-wide recession. We all got a taste of this during the COVID chip shortage which skyrocketed the prices of many electronic goods. However, it's Taiwan's all-important role in the first island chain containment strategy that makes it too strategically important for the US and its allies to allow it to fall to China. The first island chain stretches from Japan to the Philippines and beyond, and it's a physical barrier to China's ability to project naval power far from its own shores. From any point in the chain, 
Allied forces could destroy Chinese fleets as they attempt to break for the high seas, or simply interdict China's maritime trade. Japan, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia all have a vested interest in the continued containment of Chinese naval power, especially given its bullying of regional neighbors in the South China Sea. The taking of Taiwan would also allow China to launch submarines from Taiwanese bases straight into the deep water channels of the Pacific, slipping right past any effort to track them. The Line of Actual Control LAC. The LAC is a border between China and India, roughly 2,100 miles long, to which both countries lay claim. Those claims have escalated into fairly small-scale clashes between Indian and Chinese forces over the last few years. Fighting in 2020 focused primarily on the Gaiwan Valley, which led to deaths on both sides. And more recent skirmish, which took place toward the end of 2022, showed that both sides are still willing to fight for the territory. Granted, the skirmish didn't result in any deaths, and it didn't even involve the use of firearms, making it a little more than a brawl between troops stationed along the border. It even resulted in several meetings between China and India to discuss disengagement, with a supposed ceasefire being put in place to prevent further conflict. But given the history of the area, that ceasefire could end at any moment. So why is China building so much infrastructure along the border? According to the U.S. Department of Defense's 2023 annual report to Congress, China has been hard at work essentially fortifying its position along the LAC. Roads have been put in place across all three sectors of the LAC. The Pentagon identified a set of new underground storage facilities located near Doklam, as well as several new villages being set up in the neighboring country of Bhutan, itself a hotspot even if Bhutan is essentially ineffectual as a military power. There's more. China's built a dual-purpose airport supported by several helipads near the center sector of the LAC. Plus, it's built another bridge across Pangong Lake, essentially doubling the number of potential troops it can march across the lake at any given moment. China argues that these are defensive moves. They claim that they're simply fortifying to guard against Indian intrusion. But from India's point of view, all this infrastructural work has led to the belief that the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, is gearing up for some more severe offensive operations that go far beyond the relatively minor skirmishes we've seen on the border in recent years. Adding to this belief is the fact that the relationship between India and China are at a low they haven't seen in decades. Both countries are members of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which ostensibly means that they're united in their efforts to deliver economic prominence to underrepresented nations on the global stage. But that loose alliance masks bubbling tensions as India grows ever warier of China's increasing reliance on its military muscle and its deep pockets to meet its own agenda. All signs point to an escalation in tensions between the two massive military powers. And therein lies the biggest problem. Both China and India are nuclear nations. Where a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would spark international condemnation, it's unlikely that China would deploy nukes to claim such a small territory. But if China launches an offensive against India to take the LAC, now you have a conflict between two nations that not only have large armies, but access to weapons that could cause devastation on a global scale. It's no wonder the United States Institute of Peace wrote that we should all worry about the China-India border dispute in May 2023. It's a powder keg that's just waiting to explode. And if, or perhaps more likely when it explodes, it could draw the entire world into the conflict for which it may not be ready. So, it's clear that China appears to be gearing up for battle on two fronts as we enter 2024, but South Asia is far from the only hosted geopolitical hotspots that could spark wars in 2024. Next, we turn our attention back to a hotspot that's existed for decades, but has threatened to boil over again as we enter a new year. Sudan War in Sudan is hardly a revelation. The country's been subject to civil strife for nearly 70 years, starting when Sudan gained its independence in 1956. That action, which would be cause for celebration for most countries, sparked a brutal civil war that lasted until March 1972, as the south of the country tried to gain its independence from the north. An uneasy peace reigned for 11 years afterward before war broke out again in May 1983, this time with the aim of restructuring the political institutions tasked with leading the country. That war is still ongoing. So why has Sudan made this list of geopolitical hotspots for 2024 when it's already been a hotspot for so many years? The answer is found in a September 2023 report by the International Crisis Group ICG, that highlighted 10 of the biggest challenges to the United Nations in 2023 and 2024. The ICG points out that the UN Transition Assistance Mission UNITAMS, created in 2020 to help Sudan transform from an autocracy into a democracy has essentially failed its mission. 
the trigger was renewed conflict between Sudanese forces and the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, in April, which led to the UN's peacekeeping forces being relegated to the sidelines as their efforts to broker peace went up in smoke. Sure, the UNITAM's force managed to evacuate Khartoum and parts of Darfur, but right now all that's left of the UN in the country is a small skeleton staff that's focused on delivering humanitarian aid rather than creating peace in a country that's essentially been at war with itself for over 70 years. There are other problems. The renewed fighting triggered an exodus of Sudanese refugees who fled the violence to countries like Chad, Eritrea, and Egypt. The latter of those countries is a potential problem. According to the Atlantic Council, Egypt has already received 50,000 of the 259,000 Sudanese who'd already fled the conflict, and it's expecting to receive hundreds of thousands more in the coming months as fighting escalates. That in itself wouldn't be an issue were it not for the fact that Egypt has its own economic crisis to deal with, one that's already led to its people becoming disaffected, and has an ongoing conflict with Ethiopia over the Nile waters. Why is Ethiopia an issue? The RSF shares particularly strong ties with Ethiopia, essentially giving them an ally as they attempt to wrest power from Sudan's current leaders. That support threatens Egypt's borders with Sudan. Should the RSF succeed, Ethiopia gains a foothold in the territory that could strengthen its position against Egypt. Perhaps Egypt would have no choice but to launch an all-out war with Sudan if for no other reason than to topple the RSF and drive Ethiopia back to its current borders. For his part, Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, has maintained the country won't get involved in the conflict and is instead more interested in acting as a mediator between the rival factions in Sudan. But that approach doesn't explain the joint military exercises Egypt already has held with the incumbent Sudan forces or its supposed military involvement in Khartoum. The point? Sudan's civil conflict doesn't look like it's going to stay civil for very long. As fighting between the Sudanese army and the RSF rages, it looks likely that Ethiopia and Egypt will get drawn into the conflict directly, potentially sparking a war between the two that could affect the entirety of Africa. Next, let's turn our attention to another country that's already been embroiled in conflict for decades, Afghanistan. In February of 2020, the United States government officially signed a peace deal, the Doha Agreement, with the Taliban in Afghanistan that created a timeline for the US to remove its troops from the country. It marked the end of a nearly two-decade conflict between the US and the Taliban, but that agreement also seemed to renew the Taliban's confidence in its ability to take more territory from the Afghan government. Despite agreeing to hold its current borders and prevent terrorists from operating within its territory, the Taliban resumed its attack on Afghan security forces soon after. The US had no choice but to respond. Airstrikes and raids on Taliban territory followed briefly renewing the conflict between the two until April 2021, when President Joe Biden made an announcement. The United States would leave Afghanistan by September 2021. In essence, the US washed its hands of the whole issue, setting the stage for the Taliban to escalate its war against the Afghan government. Attacks immediately ramped up, and it wasn't long before the Taliban seized control of the presidential palace in Kabul. The Taliban promised it would provide security for Afghan citizens once it was in power, but that's a promise it simply can't keep. Disregarding the fact that the Taliban has wreaked more terror on the civilians than anybody over the last 20 years, it also faces attacks from another Sunni Islamist group, ISIS Khorasan or ISIS-K. The US is already well aware of the danger that ISIS-K represents. In August 2021, the group, which is primarily stationed in northern Afghanistan, launched suicide bombings near Kabul airport that resulted in the deaths of 13 U.S. troops, along with 169 Afghans. And since America's withdrawal, ISIS-K has been in open conflict with the Taliban, fighting to establish its particular interpretation of Islam the same way that the Taliban fought for theirs for so many years. This is all an ongoing conflict. To further add to the potential for war, the Taliban has also been in conflict with Iran. In 2023, utilizing American equipment left behind or seized from the former national government stockpiles, Taliban forces engaged in several skirmishes with Iranian troops on their shared border. The dispute is centered around water rights to the Helmand River, a contentious issue between the two nations that stretches all the way back to the 19th century. While tensions have de-escalated in recent months, the core issues have yet to be resolved, leaving the door wide open for further conflict. While fighting between rival factions in Afghanistan could draw global intervention as we enter 2024, another nation with infighting factions of its own might find itself embroiled in a full-blown civil war sooner rather than later. Haiti Gang warfare rages in Haiti. 
Fighting between different gangs in the country has torn Haiti apart, so much so that the country's acting president, Ariel Henry, called for armed intervention from the UN and potentially US forces as far back as the end of 2022. That intervention never came. Now the government barely maintains its control over the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, and it's seen the gang violence that began in the city slums escalate to the point where it's practically taken over. Haitians can no longer feel safe in their own homes. Thousands have already tried to flee to the US, though many were turned back and inserted right back into what's essentially an unofficial war zone. And though the US claims that it supports a multinational mission to restore order to Haiti, the only country that has said it would offer military aid is Jamaica, hardly a fighting superpower. The US, wary of being labeled as a colonizing power by anti-West voices, is only willing to act as part of a coalition, but the world seems uninterested in helping the people of Haiti restore order. None of these delays are doing anything to help Haiti. Today the country somehow miraculously escaped being thrown into a full-blown civil war. However, if nothing happens to curb the growing gang violence in Haiti, it's only a matter of time until the unstructured fighting that's already happening on the streets of Port-au-Prince grows into a civil conflict that'll threaten the entire nation. At least that's the opinion of Mercy Corps. The global team of humanitarians, which includes over 5,400 members from more than 40 countries, warned that Haiti was on the brink of civil collapse in May 2023. Their calls for resolution, though not unheralded, have gone largely unanswered. But they've also shed a little more light on the potential causes of strife that's affecting Haiti right now. The main issue? Hunger. According to the World Food Program, or WFP, the conflict that rages in Haiti is both triggered and accentuated by the country's massive food shortages. The WFP says that 4.9 million people are currently struggling to feed themselves, accounting for about 50% of Haiti's population, and that the number of hungry people in Haiti has tripled since 2016. The WFP's country director for Haiti, Jean-Martin Bauer, makes the severity of the situation clear when he says, Haiti can't wait. We cannot wait for the scale of the problem to be exposed in deaths before the world responds. Sadly, that's already happened. The poorest neighborhoods in the country's capital are already under the control of various gangs, all of which are only exacerbating the poverty and hunger problems by restricting the flow of aid services organized by the Haitian government. Food is basically unaffordable. If the various gangs in Haiti start to use these terrible conditions as propaganda, join us and you'll be taken care of, then the gangs might strengthen further to the point where the Haitian government becomes a non-factor. It'll be the gangs who fight the civil war for control of Haiti, with the government simply being relegated to the sidelines before being overthrown. Add this to the voter distrust that already exists in Haiti, only 21% of its population voted in its last election, and the situation seems primed for more poor Haitians to choose gang life simply in an effort to survive. Simply put, the Haitian government needs aid it isn't getting, and the country risks slipping through the cracks and developing into a full war zone due to larger powers placing their focus elsewhere. However, our next geopolitical hotspot has the full attention of at least one major wartime superpower, and given its government's recent actions, it appears to be heading into a full-blown civil war that could play directly into the hands of Vladimir Putin. Mali In June 2015, the Malian government met with the Coordination de Mouvement de l'Azawad, or CMA, to broker a truce between the parties. For years, the rebel CMA forces had been fighting the Mali army to gain independence, with the truce leading to a period of peace that's lasted for nearly eight years. That peace was aided by the UN. With the cooperation of both parties, the UN formed the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, or MINUSMA, bringing about 15,000 of its soldiers and police officers into the fold to help maintain and continue to broker the peace. All was going relatively well. There were occasional skirmishes and the MINUSMA lost 180 members to fighting since it entered the country, but there is a level of peace in Mali. Not uncoincidentally, that peace was shattered in 2021, right around the same time Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. When the Mali government found itself fighting the CMA during the early 2010s, it turned to France for support. The Takuba Task Force was formed, with France combining several other European powers to send 8,000 troops to contested regions. The relationship worked well for a time, but May 2021 brought with it an attempted military coup led by Colonel Asimi Goita, which threatened the political stability Mali was working toward. France was unhappy. In June 2022, France decided to leave the country, citing its deteriorating relationship with Mali's government as its primary reason. 
That deterioration came amidst Russia sneakily building its foothold in Mali. Employing the infamous Wagner Group, Russia has supplied Goita with mercenary forces for several years, fostering a relationship that initially saw Wagner operating in non-European occupied territories. Those ties clearly grew stronger over time. Goita seized power in May 2021, installing himself as Mali's interim president, and he's operated in that position with the backing of Wagner ever since. Mali essentially waved goodbye to France as it welcomed Russian cooperation with open arms, helped along in no small part with Wagner propaganda campaigns that painted France as a colonial power. Due to Imperial Russia's relative lack of colonies, the nation is ironically seen as a decolonizer in the region, despite their invasion of Ukraine and annexation of its territory. But it gets worse. Following the coup, Goita has been at odds with the previously mentioned Minusma forces stationed in Mali. That tension boiled over in June 2023 when Mali demanded that the UN withdraw its peacekeepers, with full support from Russia, leaving the UN with very little political power in the territory. This is a clear attempt by Goita to further isolate Mali from the rest of the world, and it comes at a time when Goita seems to be ramping up military operations, even while ostensibly still acting under the truce brokered in 2015. For instance, May 2023 saw Mali's government being accused of killing 500 civilians, an act supposedly supported by Wagner mercenaries, during an operation in the country's central regions. Additional clashes since 2022 have led to the displacement of around 30,000 people from Minaka, one of the largest towns in Mali. Tensions are boiling between the state, various non-state armed groups, Jama'at Nasar al-Islam wal-Muslimin, and the unit of ISIS stationed in the Greater Sahara region. War is coming. And in a very clever move, Russia seems to be supporting that upcoming conflict behind the scenes. It supported the withdrawal of UN troops while taking advantage of Mali's European allies leaving the territory, using both to establish a foothold in the African continent that it may not have envisioned ever having just five years ago. From the outside looking in, it appears Putin is playing Mali like a pawn in a game of chess. He's saying all the right things, even going so far as to claim that Russia will replace the humanitarian aid Mali loses by requesting the withdrawal of the UN. But he appears to be creating a situation in which civil conflict will reign in 2024 and beyond. Perhaps Russia is gambling on Goita coming out on top with their support, leading to Goita becoming so indebted to Moscow he'd essentially act as a puppet for the Kremlin within his own country. That's speculative. But all the ingredients are in place for a recipe that could reverse all the positive steps Mali's taken since 2015, embroiling the country in war once again. Russia stands to gain massively, as it already has access to much of Mali's natural resource wealth through its Wagner Group proxies. From two regional conflicts, one of which might have global consequences, we move into a geopolitical hotspot that's gone from being on the boil to potentially becoming nuclear as we enter 2024. North Korea Tensions with North Korea are hardly new. The US barely maintains diplomatic relations with Kim Jong-un, all but identifying him as a threat to world peace. However, it's fair to say that some have underestimated North Korea in recent years, seeing it as a nation that does a lot of chest beating without really having the firepower to back up its anti-West sentiment. That changed in 2023 for two reasons, North Korea's deepening ties with Russia and the unveiling of the Hwasol-31 tactical nuclear bomb. Starting with the latter, North Korea unveiled the Hwasol-31 in March 2023, claiming that it's a tactical nuclear warhead that can attach to smaller cruise missiles. The video accompanying the unveiling even showed the Hwasol-31 being mounted on several of the missiles we already know that North Korea has, including the Hwasol-2 cruise missile and the hwasong fo 11 na ballistic missile. Kim Jong-un's intention was clear. Not only did he want to showcase North Korea's nuclear capabilities, but he wanted the rest of the world to know he could launch his nuke whenever he wanted. The expansion of North Korea's ability to launch nukes at intermediary ranges has sent ripples across the region, as it's now believed North Korea could target as far east as the American West Coast. With an estimated stockpile of 100 nuclear weapons, a concentrated nuclear assault could be difficult to defeat even despite joint anti-ballistic efforts by South Korea, the US, and Japan. So, North Korea has nukes. That's dangerous enough, in itself, given the country's clear anti-West sentiments and the tension that's existed between it and the US for years. But then, July 2023 came along. That month saw North Korea welcome its first delegation since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, supposedly to celebrate the 70th anniversary of signing the Korean War Armistice Agreement. And who did North Korea welcome? 
Russia, specifically the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, who used the event to propose that Russia, North Korea, and China could start engaging in cooperative naval exercises in an effort to strengthen Moscow's ties to Pyongyang. Those drills haven't happened just yet, showing that Kim Jong-un is a little wary of playing that hand because he may not quite be ready for even more directly aggressive acts that could provoke the US. But make no mistake, he is no less supportive of Russia than Russia is of North Korea. September 2023 saw Kim Jong-un make a personal visit to Moscow right at a time when the US was acting to strengthen its trilateral defenses against North Korea alongside Japan and South Korea. There are also reports of increased traffic through the Tumangang Rail Facility located on the border between Russia and North Korea. That could indicate that North Korea is sending munitions to Russia to aid it in its fight against Ukraine. It's a provocation on top of provocation. North Korea has become increasingly bold in its displays of power during 2023. Could it be preparing for a future where it teams up with Russia and China to transform its typical anti-West rhetoric into a full-blown conflict in 2024? There's also the fact that North Korea has poor relationships with Japan and South Korea to consider. Both are allied with the United States and under protection of its nuclear umbrella, a guarantee that any nuclear attack against them would be seen as an attack on the US itself. Even if North Korea doesn't use its growing strength to strike against the US, its nuclear capabilities represent a clear and present threat to other Asian countries that don't align with its anti-West viewpoint. That brings us to our final entry, though admittedly less of a hotspot than the others on this list, we'll explain why in a moment. Recent events could turn it into one even against its own wishes. Iran As with North Korea, tensions between Iran and the US have always been high. Plus, Iran is no stranger to spouting anti-West rhetoric, which would make it seem like a contender for launching an all-out war in 2024. But if that happens, it's unlikely it'll be the result of direct aggression from Iran to the US. Instead, it's possible that the recent fighting between Israel and Hamas could draw both Iran and America into a conflict that neither wants. Why? Well, shortly after the October 7th terror attacks in Israel, Hezbollah claimed that Iran had helped plan and approve the attacks. Indeed, Iran is known to directly finance Hamas to the tune of around $100 million a year and is the chief supplier of the vast stockpiles of weapons and rockets that somehow make their way into the Gaza Strip despite a joint Egyptian and Israeli blockade. But Iran has a direct motivation to have aided Hamas's attack, and there are strong hints that it may have masterminded the entire terror attack that launched the current conflict. The Iranian regime's fate is tenuous at best. The nation has lost the support of much of the youth, with open protests against the regime both before and after the recent Hamas attack on Israel. Even more importantly though, Iran is increasingly isolated in the Middle East, with regional neighbors all aligning with the US and the West at large, and directly opposed to Iran. This leaves the nation in an incredibly precarious position. But a national defense disaster loomed its head when Saudi Arabia and Israel, the most vocally anti-Iranian and powerful neighbors, began to normalize relations. Both states share the view that a nuclear Iran is completely unacceptable and are extremely likely to use military force to prevent this. To prevent its most pressing threats from fully unifying against it, Iran needed to disrupt the process of normalization between the two nations and ideally reverse the wave of normalization of relations between Israel and the greater Middle East that's taken place over the last 20 years. Hamas presented the perfect opportunity paired with the election of Israel's Netanyahu and the most far-right government the nation has had in modern history. Together, the two were a perfect cocktail for inciting a conflict that would turn the greater Muslim world against Israel and hopefully undo the decades-long normalization of relations that's turned former allies against Iran. This is still speculation, but the fact that the terror attacks specifically included the capture of as many hostages as possible and their extraction to the Gaza Strip itself speak strongly that Hamas and likely Iran wanted to provoke Israel into a ground campaign in Gaza. Predictably, Hamas utilized its propaganda networks to greatly amplify the effects of Israeli military operations. It even infamously convinced the world that a failed rocket launch was an Israeli attack that killed 500, despite offering no evidence of casualties, photo and video evidence clearly showing little damage to the scene, and refusing to hand over the wreckage of the device Hamas claimed was an American-made JDAM. While there is little doubt innocent civilians are dying, 
It's important to remember that Hamas has a vested interest in inventing or amplifying casualty figures, and since Hamas militants don't wear uniforms, it's claiming all killed in the fighting as innocent civilians. Further, there is strong evidence it's launched attacks utilizing vehicle-borne IEDs on its own civilian convoys in order to stoke up anti-Israel anger. As Iran hoped, normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel has come to a grinding halt. More worrying, though, are the very real effects of Israel's campaign in Gaza and the amplification of Hamas propaganda both that are working to create the exact anger that Iran has hoped for. For its part, Iran maintains anti-Israel policies but was very quick to deny it had any involvement in Hamas's October attacks. Even though it apparently commended the operation, those mixed messages suggest that Iran is happy to keep supporting proxy troops without getting involved in the conflict directly. That mixing of messages isn't helped by Iran's foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, who has warned that Israel's engagement with Hamas could open up fighting on other fronts, while claiming that other countries need to show self-restraint in the face of the fighting. Reading between the lines, it seems like Iran wants to avoid getting dragged into a war. However, its support of Hamas could lead to a war with Israel becoming a distinct possibility, with the United States facing a similar issue of being drawn directly into the conflict because of its ties to Israel and regional allies like Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So where does all of this leave us? It would be inaccurate to claim that the world is on the brink of all-out war. Yes, several geopolitical hotspots could lead to the strengthening of anti-West powers, China especially, but the major military superpowers of the world probably aren't going to end up duking it out. Probably. With that, we end with a simple question. What geopolitical hotspot, if any, do you think could spark war in 2024? Let us know in the comments section and tell us which of these eight hotspots you think could see a conflict next year.